G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome today uh, to a special Federal Climate Minister's Debate. I want to thank you all for joining us and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Canberra is Ngunnawal country and Ngambri country and pay my respects to Elders past and present and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, just a few Zoom tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions uh, of the Shadow Minister and you should also be able to upvote other people's questions and make comments. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or you will be removed. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and will be posted on australiainstitute.tv later today. Recently, the ABC's Vote Compass revealed that climate change is the most important issue for voters this election. Yet while we have seen some very big claims in the climate space, what Australia is lacking is real solutions and real action with the type of urgency that science tells us is necessary. The National Press Club has debates on agriculture, defence, regional Australia and the economy, yet climate change which will have serious ramifications for all these issues and more has really been missing. So we put it to the public whether they thought such an event was needed and the response was overwhelming. More than 3,600 people in just a few days responded to the Australia Institute <laughs> for a debate on climate to discuss what government and opposition think need to be done during this critical action for climate change, critical decade for climate action. We invited both the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, and the Shadow Minister who's joining us today, the Honourable Chris Bowen. Unfortunately, Minister Taylor declined our invitation um, and uh, did not send a statement or anything for us to read out. So uh, you can find all of their policy details online. But we are delighted that the Shadow Minister, Chris Bowen, is able to join us today. While it may uh, make a debate somewhat difficult, uh, the issue is so important that we wanted to still have the Shadow Minister on. It's a valuable opportunity for you, the public, to interrogate Labor's climate change policies and, of course, just to discuss one of the most critical issues facing Australia and the world. I'd now like to introduce Ben Oquist, Executive Director of the Australia Institute, for a few introductory remarks and to introduce the Shadow Minister. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ebony, and, and thanks for your leadership in pursuing this webinar series right webinar series right through um, the election campaign. A, a, a valuable opportunity to discuss a wide range of policy issues and important for our democracy that people are engaged in an informed and deliberative manner. And um, it's it's a, a great testament to your skills, a, a, a great privilege for the Australia Institute to host and. I think really helping improve our democracy. So hats off uh, to you, Ebony, and, uh, and all the team involved in making this series such a success. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris Bowen, Bowen, for making the time to be here. Uh, to echo Ebony's sentiments, I, I very much want to stress that we did want this to be a debate. Um, this is a debate that Australia needs, and not talking about climate change is not going to make it go away. Uh, when it comes to climate, what is dearly needed is a, is a true contest of ideas, uh, of effective and ambitious and equitable policy that will bring down emissions in Australia uh, and help bring them down in the world and protect our environment at, at the rate and scale uh, that is so urgently needed. Uh, just days before the election was called, as you know, the, international, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its uh, final report warning of the high likelihood of global temperatures rising between one and 1.5 and 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, uh, uh, rising above that uh, critical threshold, in fact. Uh, just weeks before the election was uh, called, Australians were hit with some of the worst floods in recorded history. Uh, yet despite these events, uh, we don't have a, a leaders' debate on climate happening in this election, and that, that's, that's baffling. Uh, the Australian Institute, is dedicated wholly to research and ideas designed to drive good policy and good policy outcomes in Australia. Uh, we have a program um, on climate and energy dedicated to research uh, and good ideas in climate and energy policy. Uh, but while we can suggest uh, and advocate for policies and communicate them, we cannot implement them. That is up to our government and our parliament. 
Uh, climate change is happening now and people here in Australia and overseas are, are already having their lives turned upside down as a result. And I, I'd personally like to offer my sympathy to anyone here today who was affected by the floods uh, and the devastating fires before that. Um, to those who have been displaced or lost family and homes, the sheer urgency and reality of the climate crisis is palpable. There is enormous appetite for leadership on climate change, in my view. Uh, two thirds of Australians, 67% agree that Australia, Australia should be a world leader in finding solutions to climate change. More than two thirds of the community want Australia to set targets aligned with limiting global warming to 1.5 uh, to 2 degrees. Eight in 10 Australians support the phase out of coal fired power stations. That's calling, according to our Climate of the Nation uh, survey. In these final days before the election, it's crucial that we debate actual policies and none more so than on climate change. Um, I'm sorry that this will not be a debate in the true sense of the word, but I am looking forward to a robust discussion nonetheless. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, seeing Chris Bowen advocate for uh, these ideas uh, personally at a, a conference in uh, Sydney this week, so I know it'll be a good dis discussion. Um, he's got lots to say and he's been driving a big debate uh, in, in climate, even if we're not having the leaders debate that we needed. Um, a little bit of background on Chris, for those who don't know, he entered parliament in 2004, has held a wide range of portfolios, including serving as treasurer. Uh, uh, critically, he knows the economic implication, consequences and opportunities from climate change. Uh, he was Minister for Human Services, Minister for Immigration, Minister for Financial Services, Assistant Treasurer, Minister for Competition Policy, Minister for for small business and minister for tertiary education. Uh, so Chris has been responsible for a range of significant policy reforms and programs in these portfolios and brings that expertise to, I think, uh, one of, if the not the most important portfolio responsibilities in any government. He served as interim leader of the Labor Party and acting leader of the opposition following the 2013 federal election and served as shadow treasurer. Of course, he is now Minister for Climate Change and Energy. He's been joined here today um, by our Climate and Energy Program Director, Richie Merzian, who uh, is known to many of you, who's driving a big body of uh, research and communication at the Australia Institute covering all aspects of climate policy. Richie brings a wealth of knowledge having worked uh, inside uh, government and as a, a climate uh, diplomat and negotiator uh, internationally. Uh, thank you, uh, Richie, um, for, for your work and your leadership in driving good climate uh, policy debates um, and outcomes. Uh, with all that, uh, I'll hand back to you, Ebony, to get us going. Thank you so much for joining us today, the Honourable Chris Bowen. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, I just want to quickly outline how today will work. So first, I'm going to ask the Shadow Minister some questions, then we'll have a bit of a broader discussion, perhaps some questions from journalists, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Uh, welcome, Shadow Minister Chris Bowen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to begin by asking you about Labor's policy of 43% emissions reduction this decade. Um, you've made the point that that's an aggregation of all Labor's policies. I just wondered to start off with, could you please tell us which of those Labor policies are going to do the heavy lift lifting to get us to that target in the next decade? Thanks, Ebony. I'm delighted to join you. And just before uh, I begin, can I join you in celebrating the elders of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects and also note that it is, of course, well beyond time that uh, Australia's first peoples had a constitutionally enshrined voice to the Australian Parliament. One of the most important things an Albanese Labor government would do is progress that. Um, in relation to your question, you're right. Uh, we've put out our 43% emissions reduction target, uh, but it is more than a target. We are the only party going to this election explaining not only what our target is, but to explain how we will achieve it. The 43% is the modelled aggregate impact of all our policies, not just an ambition or an objective or a goal. It is actually the result of our policies that have been modelled by Reputex, who as well as being economic modellers, are energy modellers. And they have found that we uh, that will deliver a 43% emissions reduction with the policies by 2030, with the policies that we have announced and would implement. You ask what are the big drivers, and there are primarily... Uh, two out of all the policies we've announced, they're all important, but in terms of 
uh, emissions reduction by 2030. There's two that I would highlight. There's the reforms to the safeguard mechanism, which has become controversial in recent days with the sort of very predictable, typical toxic scare campaign by the Liberals, Nas Liberals and Nationals. But the fact is you can't reduce emissions in Australia unless you're getting emissions down from our biggest emitters. It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, and the safeguards mechanism was designed by the government and I've taken their architecture because I think the architecture is pretty good in terms of the policy design, uh, which is a, a, a scheme which applies to the top 215 emitters in the country, but take it and we'll make it work. At, at the moment, there are loopholes, more loopholes, more holes than a piece of Swiss cheese in, the, in how the baseline is set. Uh, we would put the safeguards mechanism on a trajectory to net zero and then work with those facilities through the clean energy regulator to see their emissions come down, bearing in mind the technology each facility has available and the competitive uh, pressures they face from overseas. The other one that I'll point to is rewiring the nation. Uh, we know there's no uh, transition without transmission. Uh, we need to really improve the energy grid. I know it's not particularly sexy or front page news, but unless we upgrade Australia's grid, um, we won't be getting on getting the renewables coming forward that we need. And our modelers have found that it contributes to 5% emissions reduction by 2030. Uh, so it's a big, important part of our agenda. We, we all know, we, you would all know that there are already large renewable installations being rejected by the regulators because the grid can't go, it can't go on like this. We need to get the renewable energy from where it's produced in Australia's regions to where it's consumed in the cities by and large and big industrial conurbations and rewiring the nation will be very important getting rewire, uh, getting the renewables uh, on and getting to 82% renewables by 2030, which is again is the model result of our policies. I could talk about all of them. I'm particularly proud of our transport and, and electric vehicles policy, but I know we'll probably get to that. That's an important part of our policy. And we added some more to it on the weekend. Our community's battery policy is important for opening up storage to people who otherwise can't afford a household battery. Solar banks are important for people who can't have solar panels on their roof because they're renters or in a strata arrangement. They're all important, but I would point to those two big levers. Controversially, the government has attacked both of them, to be clear. Angus has attacked both our rewiring the nation policy and our safeguards mechanism because they pretend to be committed to net zero. But when they actually see a policy that might achieve net zero, they'll always oppose the actual policy. The next question I have is um, that part of Labor's climate policy platform is the intention uh, to bid to co-host COP29 in partnership with a Pacific Island nation. Uh, I believe the Institute's put out a paper on that that we might come to a bit later. But how would Labor, if elected, go about repairing kind of Australia's relationship with the Pacific? And um, what would that look like, that bid to, to co-host a, a COP? Well, firstly, uh, uh, in relation to repairing the relationships to the Pacific, so firstly, you've got to turn up and, and you've got to engage. And that's, uh, I know that might sound basic, but it's not happening. You know, I, I uh, went to a climate forum in Penrith last week with about 400 representatives of the Pacifica community organised by the Uniting Church of Australia. It was a wonderful event. I spoke about our approach. Um, there was a huge turnout because... Uh, the Pacifica community in Australia knows what's at stake for their communities at home on their home island. The Uniting Church, which, you know, is not, um, is not an organisation that most people are afraid of, invited a long list of Liberal MPs to come and talk to that forum. Nobody showed up. I was the only political representative uh, who took the time to go and talk to the Pacifica communities. I, I, I don't think that's particularly something I need to be proud of. It's just my job. But, no, but the government didn't even turn up to show those, those communities respect. So take that principle and put it on a broader, on a broader um, a canvas, that engagement, whether it be here in Australia or with uh, ambassadors and high commissioners or whether it be with you know, visits to the Pacific to talk about our approach and to uh, engage with leaders about what is necessary, it would be an approach of Penny Wong and myself where Penny and I would both want to see climate diplomacy at the top of our diplomatic agenda. But first we have to get our domestic arrangements in order and, and to have a more credible uh, solution, a more credible answer as we go around the world. And that's nowhere near, as, no, nowhere is that more important than the Pacific. Uh, in relation to COP and our bid, I don't know whether we'll win the bid or not, of course, but we want to try because we want to one, send a message to the rest of the world that Australia's under new management when it comes to climate. Two, it's a, frankly, it's, a, it's an opportunity to showcase Australia's wares as a renewable energy powerhouse to, 
it's, it's really the world's biggest trade show. Uh, and we have so much to offer uh, the world on renewable energy. And yes, we will offer to co-host with any Pacific Island nation who chooses to. I don't know how many or, or which ones would take that up, but that would be uh, on coming to office. You know, pretty high on our diplomatic agenda to then to engage with the Pacific Islands, our Pacific Islands friends and ask, would you like to? Of course, no hard feelings from us if they, if they don't want to participate, but if they do want to participate in a bid and co-host it with us in some form, I can't think of a better way for the Pacific Island nations to make their case to the world uh, than to have them as an integral part of the COP. And in, in some form or other, if we win the bid to host the COP, they would be involved and I would see them as very genuine partners in hosting that COP. I think it's a massive opportunity. Again, I know the government has said it's a waste of money. I, I, I fundamentally and profoundly disagree. It is not a waste of money to host a COP in Australia uh, uh, for all those reasons. And I just want to make this one final point. As we talk about the Pacific, as important as it is, and it is viral and must be the top of our agenda, we must never, ever forget it is not just about the Pacific. Our brothers and sisters in the Torres Strait, uh, Torres Strait Islanders are facing very, very similar issues uh, on Australian soil and Australian territorial soil. Uh, they are facing the impact of raise, rising sea levels just as Pacific Islands are. So as we talk about the Pacific, we should never forget the Torres Strait. Yeah, just sticking with that briefly, I guess, will you re will a Labor government rejoin the United Nations Green Climate Fund, which is a key source of funding for climate action, particularly in the Pacific, but also for developing countries? So, Ebony, what we've said uh, it would be our priorities, uh, what we announced in our Pacific package, again, I think last week, um, that is an increase in overseas uh, development assistance to the Pacific of $525 million, which is a substantial boost to the Pacific package. Um, we believe our aid program, as important as it is around the world, must really uh, be more focused on the Pacific. We would also establish a Pacific Climate Infrastructure Financing Partnership, which would really be, again, a level of engagement with, um, with Pacific Islands, practically based on, on joint investments, which can uh, impact in relation to uh, what the Pacific Islands can do. In relation to what else we can do, uh, we would need to look at that in government and, and get advice and talk to Pacific Islands. But I think they're pretty two, two pretty big and substantial commitments that we've made pre-election. Uh, most petroleum use in Australia is from exports, yet we know there's really been um, no policies to drive down demand for foreign oil. Um, I know you want to talk about electric vehicles, but I did want to ask about Labor's policies specifically around increasing public and active transport and, and when Australia will have fuel efficiency standards. Um, and then on EVs, particularly anything around manufacturing electric buses. So public and active transport, fuel efficiency standards, how are we going to drive down emissions in the transport sector? Yeah, all, all very important issues, Ebony. In relation to public transport, of course, I'd, I'd be negligent if I didn't point out Labor's track record at the federal level uh, on public transport, because that shows the sort of approach we take. And of course, the Prime Minister in our government would be the former Transport Minister who engineered the big investments in public transport under the last Labor government. So it's interesting that the last government, the Rudd-Gillard government, committed more funding to urban public transport infrastructure than all the federal governments preceding it from 1901. One government committed more money to uh, public transport infrastructure than every other government uh, for, you know, 107 uh, more years uh, for uh, more than 120 20 years um, and that is that is, I think sort of says a lot about Albo's approach and about the approach that the Labor Party takes in office and of course we've made commitments to public transport projects in this election uh, in Hobart, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and in New South Wales so again it's not just sort of a, a rhetoric or some sort of in principle we've actually put uh, the, um, the money uh, behind public transport projects as well. In relation to active infrastructure, you know, to be clear, this is really has to be a partnership between all levels of government, local government. I'm a former mayor, so I get how important local government is for local planning decisions around things like uh, active transport. State government funds a lot of the exact, you know, the, the particular infrastructure projects. And of course, we're funders. And I think our project, our, our participation in active transport comes in funding, saying to the state, states and local government, if we're funding this particular project, we'd like to know what you're considering for active transport elements of it, whether it's a cycle path alongside um, a road, 
And probably the best example of that is the M7 in Western Sydney, which has, I think it's 56 kilometres of cycle path along the M7. I mean, I drive on the M7 a lot. Um, it's where I live. And, you know, particularly on the weekend, you see many cyclists and you can travel through Western Sydney on that cycle path and it's interconnections with other cycle networks. So that's the example. Catherine King, our Shadow Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, has already signalled that approach that we would be factoring in active transport to our funding mechanisms. In relation to uh, electric vehicles, um, uh, let's just quickly run through what our policy is because it's pretty important. Cutting the taxes on EVs to make them more affordable. So that's abolishing the fringe benefits tax and the tariff on every uh, no emissions vehicle below uh, the luxury car tax threshold. Um, that makes a real difference. The FBT is important because while it doesn't apply to consumers, it only applies to businesses buying uh, an EV for their employees. It's really important for two quick reasons. One, 50% of all car sales in Australia are fleet. So if you're not buying EVs in your fleet, you're not really making progress. And secondly, fleets turn over every two or three years. We need a second-hand EV market in Australia. There's none to speak of at the moment. Getting fleet to tr transition to hydrogen or EVs means we'll have a second-hand market in three or four years' time. Got to start. Um, and that also applies to the Commonwealth fleet. We would take the Commonwealth fleet to no emissions vehicles. 75% of purchases by 2025 would be either hydrogen or EV. Again, Commonwealth turns over its cars every three years. There's 10,000 cars in the Commonwealth fleet. That's going to flow through to a second-hand EV market. And it sends a message to manufacturers. If you want to win the Commonwealth contract, which is one of the biggest in the country, you're going to have to provide uh, no emissions vehicles to Australia. Uh, and then, of course, on the weekend, uh, we announced our Drive the Nation Fund, uh, Driving the Nation Fund, which would see a, a fast charger once every 150 kilometres on the National Highway Network. Now, we understand the range anxiety is a big concern, holding people back. You know, to be frank, not all of us drive long, long distances, but all of us like the idea of driving long distances, even if we don't. So it will hold people back from buying EVs if, they are, if they're not convinced there's good, fast charging infrastructure. I'm delighted we'll, to say we'll partner with the NRMA, who's done great work on, um, on the potential rollout of fast chargers across the country. They're going to co-fund uh, this initiative with us if we win office. So I want to pay tribute to the NRMA for the good work they've done. They're leading that debate. You know, we want to be able to say whether you're, tra whether you're traveling from Perth to Sydney or Adelaide to Darwin or Brisbane down to Adelaide via whichever way you want to go, there will be a guaranteed fast charger on average once every 150 Ks. I drive an EV myself. I know how you, know, you, do, you do have to, as much as I love my EV and I really do, you do have to plan your trip and think about your charging. If you just know that infrastructure is there, I drive mine between Sydney and Canberra a lot, for example, it can make the journey without charging, but if I'm not fully charged, I need to know that there's a charger there and it just makes such a difference to your planning. In relation to vehicle emission standards, I welcome the fact that manufacturers now have a voluntary code. I mean, that's a, that's a good step forward. I want to see that working. We'll work with the manufacturers on their code uh, and its voluntary nature. Uh, but my focus has been on bringing the cost down, dealing with range anxiety and getting a secondhand market going by driving fleet purchases. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've got a thousand people on the line with us today. Thank you so much. I can see you're putting questions in here uh, for Chris Bowen as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We will come to questions from the audience in a minute, but we've still got a few others here. Um, Chris Bowen, in the last few years, the federal government has given billions of dollars in subsidies, in particular to the gas industry, to open up new gas basins that will go mainly for export, but it's really justified that mainly as increasing gas supply for the domestic market. Um, do you think that money, if it had gone instead to households, businesses and industries to electrify, it would have been a more effective way of cutting energy bills? Um, and, you know, can the same be said for cutting the fuel excise recently instead of electric transport subsidies? So, Ebony, in relation to gas, you know, my position is has been crystal clear and been presented, you know, many, many forums, and it's not one which everybody loves, but, you know, I will always call it as I see it. We've got on one side the Liberal National Party saying there's a gas-led recovery, gas-fired recovery is going to create an economic boom. It's not true. It's never been true. It's a lie. Um, there is no substance to that. There is no gas-led recovery and the Labor Party does not you know, buy into the concept of a gas-led recovery and we won't because it's, it's just a fraudulent statement. Having said that, there are others who say we need to get gas out of the system ASAP. Um, 
while I don't regard gas necessarily as a transition fuel, it is the case that we need peaking and firming while we're transitioning to renewable energy and while we're building the storage. You know, the AEMO has found we need to treble our storage, whether it be through batteries or pumped hydro or hydrogen. We need to keep reliable uh, energy as we move to 100% renewables um, via 82% by 2030. And that means we're gonna need peaking and firming. And when you come to peaking and firming, you've really only got three options. Coal-fired power, which maybe we'll talk about, nuclear, which I don't support, and gas. And you know, gas does have um, the benefit of being able to switch on and off really quickly, as opposed to coal. Once you start a coal-fired power station, you can't switch it off. Um, in relation to um, you know the integrity of, of funding, um, well, I support a federal ICAC. We need a federal ICAC, and a federal ICAC would be able to examine all issues of integrity, whether it be government funding, gas, or anything else. And uh, it's just unbelievable we're still having this debate. Yeah. Um, I want to stick with coal-fired power stations there that you mentioned. The Australia Institute's annual Climate of the Nation survey shows around 8 in 10 Australians support the phase-out of coal-fired power stations. <laughs> We've seen that Hazelwood closing suddenly caused big problems. Clearly, there is a role there for government in managing the retirement of Australia's ageing coal-fired power fleet. And we know recently that the Australian energy market operator said that regular breakdowns at gas and coal-fired power stations coupled with the, the high cost of gas and coal at the moment is really pushing up electricity, wholesale electricity prices. What is Labor's plan to manage the phase out of our expensive now and aging coal-fired power stations, um, you know, as, as that fleet ages and needs to retire? Yeah, so um, you're right. Coal-fired power stations will close regardless of who's in office. I'm prepared to acknowledge that the government isn't. Um, there have been many closures under the current government, but they're not being managed, as you suggested, and uh, they will continue. They need to be managed, and there will be no new coal-fired power, certainly uh, coming on. The government pretends that they'll build a new coal-fired power station at Collins. Well, I've got to, I've got to say, I do not believe um, that, is a, that is a promise which they will keep, um, it, that there won't be new coal-fired power in, in Australia, and I'm prepared to say so. And so as those ageing coal-fired power stations are closed, we need to manage that change, as you suggest. And, there, and there's really two elements to managing the change. There's the energy supply across the country. That's important. More renewables and more storage. We've got a massive task when it comes to storage. Nobody's more passionate about building storage than me uh, because, you know, when the, our opponents say, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, that's about as sensible as saying the rain doesn't always fall. Well, we store water so we can drink it while the rain's not falling. We can store renewable energy when when wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining. It's a massive task that we are nowhere near what we need to do to build that storage. So we've got to manage the energy part of coal fire power closing down. And then we've got to manage the community part and that is jobs. And uh, I think we do that by creating new jobs in renewable energy. That's one of the keys and manufacturing and manufacturing of renewables to bring all three together. That's why when we modeled, uh, why I'm pleased that when we modeled our policies and its impact, their impact, through power prices, through direct investments, et cetera, our policies create 604,000 jobs across the country. And five out of six of those are in the regions. Now, the regions that will mainly benefit from our policies are also coal regions because that's where they create energy. They're good at it. So as we invest more and we, we get the framework for investment in renewable energy, that's going to happen in those same communities that are changing because coal-fired power stations are closing. A great example of that is offshore wind. A great example, I'll just finish on this point. A great example is offshore wind, which, you know, we push to make legal. You don't get many wins in opposition. I'll take that one. We push to make it legal and it's now legal. Um, offshore wind is great because it creates a lot of energy. Great, it creates a lot of jobs. It also is directly linked to coal, to coal regions, because that's where the grid is strongest. They need to feed in those massive turbines into the grid. So they'll do that in communities in which there used to be or are tr transitioning out coal-fired power stations, creating jobs because those big turbines need maintenance and they need ships to take the workers out. So that's a great example of with the right policies, jobs you can create in areas which are going through economic change as a result of um, coal-fired power stations closing. Uh, I've got a question that kind of follows on from that from Mickey Perkins, the environment reporter at The Age, who asks, uh, so then will you create a national energy plan to oversee that transition? How, how are you really going to manage that at the federal level? Well, the National Energy Plan is our powering Australia policy. I mean, it's the most comprehensive energy policy that's been released by an opposition. And it is really all about that. 
It's about managing this change, about getting more renewables, 82% renewables into the system by 2030, uh, 82% of our electricity being renewables uh, and creating jobs, 604,000, five out of six of them in the regions. Yeah, of course, we'll need to work with particular communities uh, on their on their changes. And you know, that'll be a ground up process where we work, work with communities about what's going on uh, with particular changes. But really it's about creating those new jobs, that renewable energy creation and getting the jobs going through cheaper power prices, whether it be renewable energy manufacturing itself. You know, I, I find it extraordinary that we put, we've put as a nation 60 million solar panels on our roofs in the last 10 years, I'm sure Everybody, if not almost everybody in this uh, in this webinar has got solar panels on their roof. We've all done that in the last 10 years. That's 60 million solar panels. 1% are being made in Australia. One, and you've really got to try hard to get Australian made um, panels. I can tell you I've done it and you've, you've got to go and uh, procure them and it's not always easy. So um, we can change that by making more of them in Australia. Uh, Chris, uh, I've got a question here from Jacob Grieber at um, the AFR. He says, Mr. Bowen, how should voters think about cost of living, which Labor is blaming on the government more broadly, given the prospect and risk that the cost of the transition leads to upward pressure on prices before they come down? Who should bear this cost and how do you plan to spread any pain? Nope. Well, I mean, Jacob, the good news is, as you know, that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy followed by then gas, then coal and nuclear, in that order. Renewables, then gas, then coal and nuclear. So we get more renewables in the system, we're reducing power prices. That's just a statement of fact. And so we are managing this change, but we're managing it in a change which is not bringing in more expensive energy, bringing in cheaper energy. And that includes, by the way, despite the myth peddled by some, that includes the cost of storage and transmission, even including the cost of storage and transmission, renewable energy is still the cheapest. Um, and we do we need big investments in in transmission and storage, but even factoring those investments in, renewables is the cheapest. So that actually puts downward pressure on prices, as is evidenced again in our modelling. Um, so of course there's big cost of living pressures in Australia, but one of the things we can do is get this change well underway with a proper framework which encourages private sector investment in renewables, the cheapest form of energy. Um, Richie, I might just ask you there, uh, I know Germany's um, taken an approach that we were talking about earlier to managing the phase out of coal. What are other countries doing and how are they approaching it? Most of them are, are basically, at least using European examples, being forward leaning in actually mapping out the retirement of their fleets. Germany in particular, I think, has been best practice where they brought together the unions, the owners of the coal-fired power stations, the state governments, um, even NGOs, and together they mapped out what the retirement plan would, would look like for every single coal power station in the country. Um, and I guess the, the big question is whether Australia can do the same thing. Right now what's happening is we don't have a national plan, so deals are stitched up between state governments and the owners of these coal-fired power stations. And that's happening on a state-by-state -state level, despite us having a national electricity market. So I guess what the question is, is do we lean into that and actually say, no, we need an active plan here because they're gonna retire faster than their nameplate retirement dates. Um, so I've got another question here, Chris, uh, from Marion Ray at AAP. She asks, would la a Labor administration keep issuing um, ACUs as well as the new safeguard mechanism credits they've mentioned? In other words, a two-tiered carbon market. Uh, yeah, I'll answer that, but I just want to quickly also uh, answer Richie's point and agree with it, in effect. Um, uh, Richie is right about what's happening. States are doing the hard yards because... They're the only ones interested in this change at the moment. I want that. I want to have continued engagement from the states and with the states, but I want that as part of our national framework. Uh, it was extraordinary that uh, recently we had the announcement of a large coal-fired power station, and um, and uh, Matt Keane was all over it as the state minister, and Angus Taylor found out about it the night before. He wasn't even in the room where it happened. Wasn't engaged because the federal government is regarded by all the serious players as irrelevant because they've made themselves irrelevant. I want to bring the federal government back to the centre of that change um, because it is a key part of our responsibilities, working in partnership with the states. And one of the first things I would do if we came first on May 21st is convene a meeting of my state and territory colleagues to help get that, that process back on track. That would be 
very high on my to-do list, uh, should, I, should I be sworn in. Um, in relation to our Act Users and Safeguard Mechanism credits, yes, is the uh, fundamental answer. We would have the Act Use system continue and we would have credits. And part of our policy is to int introduce below the baseline credits for safeguard facilities. That's also been government policy. They just haven't got around to doing it. Um, we would get around to doing it um, because I do think it's an important part of the architecture. I will say in relation to credits though, integrity is important. Um, I find the recent reports of integrity problems with ACUs concerning, stroke troubling. I know the Australia Institute has been playing a, a, an important role in, in progressing that. I'm not here, to be honest, to determine, to arbitrate whether those concerns are made out and valid, but I'm concerned by them. And I want a process in relation to ACUs which is beyond reproach and which has public confidence. Hence, I've announced, and I actually did, to be fair, announce this even before these concerns came to light uh, in recent weeks, because we announced it as part of our December 3rd Powering Australia package, that we would have a comprehensive, but short and sharp, because you've got to get on with it, but I want it to be independent and comprehensive re review of the methods and the ACU scheme to ensure that it is producing real abatement. I'm not interested in carbon credits, which pay people not to clear land, which was never going to be cleared. That's just not on. Now, again, I stress, I'm not here to declare or arbitrate. I'm not going to do the review that the concerns are made out or this change is necessary or that change is necessary, but we will have that review done independently so that I can have confidence as the minister in the ACU scheme. Um, I'm going to take a question from the audience now, and then I've still got a couple of other <laughs> journalists uh, questions to follow up, but I've got a lot of people here in the questions asking about fossil fuel subsidies, Chris Bowen, Roger Tonkin and Tom broadhurst Hill have both asked, will Labor commit to uh, redirecting the billions of dollars in subsidies going to fossil fuels to renewable solutions with a future? And another question, will Labor withdraw subsidies for fossil fuels? Surely that's the first step in any transition. Well, I think the first step is to get the policy framework right. And that's what our Powering Australia document does by the safeguard mechanism changes, for example, requiring the emissions reduction of the biggest emitters um, directly in consultation with them on what's doable, et cetera. Um, but that's the policy approach I take. Um, there, in relation, to be clear, in relation to fossil fuel subsidies, I think you know there's definitional issues. Some people have very broad definitions of what a fossil fuel subsidy is. Some of us would agree on what many of them are, but there are areas where like investments in transport etc which some people regard as fossil fuel subsidies which i think is more contested uh, and more debatable um, but the policy framework that i take this election and will implement is the one encompassed in the powering australia document the most comprehensive energy and climate change policy and opposition has released in a long time backed up by all that modeling and it has that impact getting 82 percent renewables and 43 percent emissions reduction uh, I've got another question here from Linda Ward, who asks why Labor is supporting uh, the LNP government on opening 114 new coal and gas projects uh, when we're already experiencing the impacts of climate. Could you just talk a little bit about that pipeline of fossil fuel projects? Well, I appreciate the question. It is, you know, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful that that is a Greens Party talking point, that uh, particular point, but I'm more than happy to deal with it. I, I believe the market determines demand for Australian exports and Australian resources. I believe the market is changing. 80% of our trading partners committed to net zero. Um, but what I'm going to do and what the Labor government will do is see the environmental process work through. Actually, environmental approvals are an important matter of law. And actually, when a government or alternative government says, we don't care what environmental approvals find, we're not going to allow that project under environmental approvals. You undermine that actual environmental approval process. You actually bring it into question and leave it open to legal challenge. So you've got to proceed pretty carefully here um, and not you know, score an own goal by undermining the environmental approval process. That's the approach we take. If a project gets through environmental approval processes and it stacks up financially for the proponent, uh, well, then that project can proceed. But it's got to go through those processes. So it's not quite right what uh, my friends in the Greens Party say about, you know, uh, Labor and Liberal support for particular projects. Labor, the Labor Party, I can only speak for myself, the Liberal Party can speak for itself in forums it chooses to participate in. But um, we believe in the environmental process proceeding.
Um, I will just say there's a couple of people asking why we didn't invite the Greens to participate in this debate. Uh, this was designed to be a federal climate minister's debate. Uh, however, for people interested in the Greens policies, we are in talks with Adam Bant's office for uh, a webinar with the Greens leader in the coming weeks before the election. Uh, I've got a question here from Adam Morton at The Guardian. He asks Chris Bowen, concerns have been raised by Professor Andrew McIntosh and others about the role of the clean energy regulator in the administration of uh, carbon credits and the emissions reduction fund, will the role of the regulator be included in the review that you have promised? Well, the review will look at the integrity of the system and, and what the what the reviewer and reviewers haven't made a, you know haven't made any appointments yet, but uh, what they regard as relevant to the integrity of the system. Now, I must say that the makeup of the clean energy regulator, both the well, there's the clean energy regulator has a number of elements. There's sort of full-time government employees, and then there's uh, part-time appointments. But I would I would look at those on their merits on coming to office. Um, I, the clean energy regulator himself, David Parker, is a respected uh, bureaucrat um, and uh, has my respect in relation to other appointments and other processes. I would wait. I'm not getting ahead of myself. I would wait uh, to come into office before reaching a determination on those. Okay. Uh, a question here from Michael Mazengarb from Renew Economy. Is Labor open to strengthening its medium-term targets? And if not, how will Labor respond to pressure from the Greens and independents who are calling for stronger targets? Uh, we might stick with that. Well, the targets we'll implement are the targets we're taking to the people. And that's 43%. And that's what we would implement as a Labor government. Um, I've said that it would be ideal to legislate those targets, that target in particular, that would be ideal. But if there's not support in the parliament and particularly in the Senate, then we will proceed and implement that target. It doesn't actually need legislation. We can notify the conference of the parties of Australia's new target and we would do so. So um, that is, I, I think it's important to be fair. I understand people's views. You know, you've got the Liberals and National saying they're at 26 to 28, we're at 43, others are higher. I do make the point that 43 isn't just our target. It's the model result of our policies with respect, the Greens can't say that. They can't, they can't put a, uh, an explanation or a modelled uh, view of how they would achieve their target. We can, um, but it's important in this, in closing down the climate wars and ending this toxic politics that governments do what they say they're going to do. We will, we will implement that 43% target, ideally with legislation, but if not with legislation, uh, we would get on with the job. And, and if, doesn't, if it's not going to be legislated, then you know, I respect the views of others, but that would be what we just get on and do. Uh, I've got a question from the audience. John Englart says the United Nations Secretary General and the latest IPCC climate report identified reducing methane emissions as incredibly important coming from agriculture and the mining of coal and gas and waste landfill. Uh, will Labor, uh, what will Labor do in boosting accurate measurements of methane emissions? And would you push for Australia to sign on to the global methane pledge of reducing methane emissions by 30%? Uh, by well, 2030. Look, I'm not going to sign on to a pledge which I, I don't know um, how it would be implemented in Australia without getting further advice. So it's very important, frankly, as the alternative government, that anything we say we do, we know how we would achieve it. Yes, it's important to reduce methane. Absolutely. No question. Um, particularly in Australia's context, with as the listener said, or as the participant said, both our resources sector and our agriculture sector. So there's plenty to do uh, in relation to methane. But I'm not going to sign up to a pledge, we weren't consulted about the pledge as the opposition, nor do I would I expect that we would be by those who presented it in Glasgow. It's not appropriate to engage in an opposition and form government. Then I look forward to talking to my international counterparts about uh, their methane reduction programs and how Australia might participate in that. But that's not a that's not a commitment I'm in a position to make without having all the evidence and advice about what is doable in the Australian context. But I know making progress is doable. I know we can reduce agricultural uh, methane emissions by great Australian science. I mean, the asparagopsis seaweed is a modern miracle, reducing methane from cattle by, you know, almost 100%, you know, very big figures um, that you get methane reduction. But I also, to be fair, recognise it's a challenge because we're a broad acre farming country. Uh, we spread our cattle out over many hundreds of thousands of acres in Australia. We don't have feedlot um, farming like they do in some other countries. So, 
putting their asparagopsis seaweed into the feed is a lot harder in Australia. So that's not to say we shouldn't do it or we shouldn't try, we shouldn't have government engagement. But, you know, it is to say that it's not just as easy as saying we're going to just reduce agricultural emissions by 80% or some figure without having very thorough scientific advice about what's achievable when, when it comes to methane. Um, I've got a couple of questions in here that I clocked that were on carbon capture and storage. I'm sorry, there's so many questions coming in. I'm finding it hard to keep a hold of them. Chris Bowen, um, we know a lot Welcome of Welcome to my world, Emily. <laughs> has been invested in carbon capture and storage in Australia without too much to show for it. Uh, what role does Labor, a go Labor government see carbon capture and storage playing in the future here, given, you know, we've already wasted billions with virtually nothing to show for it? Well, again, my approach to carbon capture and storage is very much based on scientific evidence and research and results. Um, and again, this gets very ideological. Government thinks carbon capture and storage is to answer all the problems that you don't really need to do. I don't mean to, if Angus was here, he could say it, but their view is by and large, carbon capture and storage is extremely important going forward. There are others who say carbon capture and storage has never worked, will never work, can't work. I have an evidence-based approach. Um, we don't have the luxury of ideology. If something works, it should be embraced. And if something doesn't work, we must reject it and move on. Now, carbon capture and storage hasn't worked in coal. It might be won't work in coal. No evidence it will ever work with anything to do with coal. Um, and we shouldn't pretend that it ever would. It's, no, it's been tried. No, no problem in trying. The right thing to do to try it, but it just hasn't stacked up. Uh, well, does it work in other sectors? Well, uh, we, I don't mind companies giving it a go but it's got to be evidentiary based and we've got to see real emissions reduction. I want fewer emissions in the air. That's what I want. I don't, I'm not ideological about how we achieve that. I note that the IPCC has found, for example, going forward, that we're going to need negative emissions. We're going to need direct air capture of carbon. Um, that's the IPCC's review. That's, that's next level CCS. That's taking CCS to the next level. Um, that's what the IPCC says. So I just don't think we had the luxury of, you know, tribal sort of CCS is great, CCS is terrible. Um, I take a more evidence pragmatic approach. It's not going to work in, in many, many cases. If it can be shown to work in a way that not just the company says, but is independently verified by chief scientists and others, then, then I'm up for that discussion. I'm not here to say that CCS is the answer, nor that it's necessarily are never going to work in any circumstance. We know where it hasn't worked. Let's just see how it goes into the future. Um, Richie, I might just ask you there, I know the Australia Institute has done a lot of uh, research into carbon capture and storage. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, if it's evidence-based, then the evidence will show CCS has been a colossal failure. Over $4 billion committed by state and federal governments in Australia over two decades, not a single fully operational CCS site to show for it. The only one that can be pointed to is Chevron's Gorgon site, and that's still not fully operational. And because it failed, it released more emissions than an entire year's worth of domestic aviation in a normal year. So that, that's sort of what CCS is showing. The worst part is that most CCS projects around the world are used for enhanced oil recovery. That means you push the CO2 down, you get more oil, and when you burn that oil, you end up with more emissions. So really, if the goal is less emissions, as Chris said, then it's hard to see how CCS will benefit. The only question then is, does CCS deserve more public support? Because it's certainly failed upwards in attracting lots of, lots of dollars from the taxpayer, both state and federal. So really, would CCS deserve more public funding would be the, the question. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I can tell if you're interested in carbon capture and storage or on the Australia Institute's research around the integrity questions around our carbon credits market and offsets and uh, around the regulator that Chris referred to earlier, please head on over to our website, australiainstitute.org.au. We're a public policy think tank. All our research is freely available to the public and you can read it there. Um, Chris Bowen, I can see a lot of people, including John McBain in the questions, asking not just around mitigation but adaptation. I referred in my introduction obviously to the fact that Australia has <laughs> been experiencing floods, uh, bushfires, the black summer bushfires. We're really dealing with the impacts of climate change here and now in a lot of communities around Australia. Uh, what is Labor going to be doing and how might you work with state and local governments um, to really help communities uh, adapt as we deal with those impacts that are already here with us? 
Yeah, it's a great question and important issue because we just, you know, as much as it pains me to say, we have to acknowledge that we are going to need adaptation because the world has left it too late. There has been warming. There will continue to be warming. We need to hold it as low as possible going forward, but it's already having impacts. And we can see that every day in Australia. We know the impacts it's going to have, has had, is having, and will have into the future. We have to be honest about that. I guess I'd point to a few things. Firstly, there's the um, emergency relief fund, which the government has. They haven't spent any meaningful money out of it. We would spend $200 million a year on adaptation, on things like you know, cyclone shelters and flood levees and bushfire prevention management. We are just going to need to do that. Um, and we need to acknowledge that. We need to work with communities as we do so. What I would point to more broadly, though, is the need to deal with the climate change impacts on Australians' health across the board, not just in communities impacted by natural disasters, but all of us. Um, uh, this, is, this is real and urgent. You know, we're adding one day of heat wave to Australia every five years. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but people will die as a result of that, uh, particularly our elderly people. Um, I represent an area where, you know, there's not that much tree cover. Many families don't have air conditioning. When you add a day, uh, every five years to heat waves, you're really impacting on people who are struggling to cope. We're going to see impacts of that on coronary uh, results, on, co on coronary events, people having more heart attacks as it gets, stays hotter for longer. Um, we're going to see the impact of vector-borne diseases, um, of mosquito-borne uh, illnesses, uh, all across the board, we're going to see that. So we need to have a national health policy priority area of the climate change impacts on health. We've announced that. Um, that's important. That's the Commonwealth and the states identifying an area important in health and really prioritising it. There's there's a number of them at the moment. They're all important. There's diabetes and wound management and you know a, a number of important areas. I, I can't see a reason why the climate change impacts of health wouldn't be one of those areas, and we would do that. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple more questions here. One is from Glenn Ryan, who asks, um, will Labor implement any specific policy to set targets and reduce emissions from sectors other than electricity? Well, our policies are economy, our, our, our emissions reduction is economy wide. That's what our modelling looks at. It's not just electricity, 43%. Obviously, 82% renewables is just electricity, but 43% is across the board. As a result of all our policies, including our, our electric vehicle and transport policies I've talked about, safeguard mechanism, which is in the, in the industry sector by and large, and resources. So, um, the answer to that is yes. I, um, the participant might not have been clear on our, uh, our policies. It's not just electricity, 43% across the board. Uh, I've got a couple of people asking about the ambition of Labor's target here. Warren Dell says the Labor Party's 2030 aim is 43%. Why not 47 to 50%? Can you just talk to us a little bit about how you arrived in that target? Sure. Um, as I said, it's not it, the, the target is the result of our policies. So I didn't say to the modelers, I want 43% and tell me what policies achieve it. I said the modelers, um, here's the policies we're going to announce, safeguards, mechanisms, rewiring nation, all of them. They then put it through their model and say, this gives you 43%. Now, as you know, it's also the case that 43% is what's necessary for net zero by 2030. If you're not at 43%, you've got no chance of getting to net zero. Um, it brings us back to the pact in the world. It's equivalent with Canada and South Korea, for example. So it brings us back to the international pact. But I just want to make this point too, because I know a number of the participants will say as... as uh, as, that, as that participant just said, why not hire? I've got to be honest with you. We're starting in 2022. I wish we were starting in 2013 or 2016 or 2019 and setting out what we could do by 2030. 2030 is, is you know, coming up on us real quick. It's 92 months. This is a big change. You know, to get 43% emissions reduction in 92 months, the biggest transformation our economy has been through um, you know, our, our modern economy has been through and we've got 92 months to do it. So sure, if we, you know, won the elections in 2013, 16 or 19, then, you know, maybe we could have got the framework in earlier. But when you come second in an election, it means you don't have the capacity to put your policies into place. Uh, we've come second in too many elections. I hope to come first on May 21st so that we can get on with the job. But we are starting late in 2022. There's... Uh, I'll just say bluntly, 
there's a cost to nine years of denial and delay. And that cost is not being able to achieve the emissions reductions by 2030 that many people would like to see. Now, we'll put the 43% in, we'll get the policies to achieve it in due course, of course. Um, uh, we would set the 2035 target in due course, but the 2030 target that we can achieve and is realistic as well as being ambitious is 43. Chris, we've only got a few minutes to go. In one minute, what is your pitch uh, for people who care about climate change this election? When you, if you care about climate change action, the most important thing that can happen is to change the government. That is the most important thing. I understand many people have many views about many things, but the fact of the matter is we've had nine years of effective denial. We've had nine years and still in this election campaign, we've got senior members of the government arguing about the very basics about whether net zero is something they're working towards. Net zero is the bare minimum. It's the absolute, absolutely essential starting point. It's not a radical concept. And the government of the day is arguing about whether they're even committed to that. So we need to change the government so that we then get the framework in place and we get on with the job. Nothing will change without a change of government on May the 21st. Why would we expect that after nine years of climate denial and delay, the next three years are going to be any different? Why would we, why would we expect that after nine years of, of using the toxic politics of identity to pitch Australians against each other, anything would change? We want to unite Australians. You will never find me or Al Albo or anybody in the Labor government saying, well, inner city dwellers care about climate change and regional uh, dwellers pay the cost of action on climate change. It's a lie. We want to bring all Australians with us on this journey, where regardless of where they live, regardless of their views about the debate previously. This is a massive challenge for the world. It's frankly a massive economic opportunity for Australia. And it's about time we had a government which seized that opportunity, took its international responsibilities seriously, created jobs in Australia, created investment in Australia, got the policy right and got on with the jobs of creating got on with the job of creating the jobs of the future by giving the country a climate change policy, which is sensible. Ben Oquist, do you want to uh, take us out? Thank you, Ebony. Thank you, everybody, for participating. What a great debate and discussion. Uh, hundreds of comments uh, flying in, hundreds of questions, uh, such engagement. As you said, you know, over a thousand people online. Uh, what a great thing for democracy. Um, uh, this discussion has been and uh, so much enthusiasm and passion and ideas. Uh, thank you, Ebony. Thank you, uh, Richie, for uh, bringing us uh, all together and, and so many of the ideas that are helping drive these discussions. But of course, most of all, thank you to Chris Bowen. Um, what what uh, fronting up, uh, taking questions from all comers, from journalists, the public, from Ebony, from uh, Richie, in a, in a really lively discussion that's not, not just great for uh, climate, but uh, as I said at the beginning, I think great for our democracy can only flourish a democracy with a, a contest of ideas from across the political spectrum. And we saw some of that uh, today. Thank you for your enthusiasm and uh, uh, a passion that you're bringing to the final stages of this election campaign. I know you've got a lot on and we really appreciate the engagement. Thanks you for your comments about the importance of uh, integrity in our climate markets um, and, and obviously your concerns and, and passion there, as you mentioned, the Australian Institute's been working a lot on that. And we noted your, your strong language today. Thank you for that. Um, uh, for fronting up, uh, we didn't get um, both sides of the debate, but we sure got a debate and discussion. Um, and I, I think this election campaign is better for what we've just experienced there with a big engagement from a wide uh, group of Australians from a, a, across Australia. Thank you all for for turning up uh, and, and thanks 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 chris thanks ben thanks chris bowen thanks richie mersey and thank you to all of you who have tuned in today we will have to wrap it up there as always sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions we do have more webinars coming up during the election next week you can join us on wednesday with helen haynes and zali stegel the independent members for indi and waringa about the integrity election huge focus on that this election so head on over to the australia institute.org 
australiainstitute.org.au uh, to sign up for that webinar next week. And as I said, we are in discussions with Adam Bant's office about a webinar uh, before the end of the uh, before the election uh, on that. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Australia Institute's podcast, Follow the Money, where we take big economic issues and explain them in plain English. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Uh, if you had to duck out for any reason, uh, don't forget to tell your friends. You can catch up with this online at australiainstitute.tv. Thank you again, Chris, Ben, Richie. We really appreciate all your time today. Stay safe out there and we'll see you all soon. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> Bye, everyone. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>